again, you're, you're with us here uh, with Dr. Gans and collecting airship and Zeppelin. Excellent, and we are. All right, and we'll get our transcript going. And there we have it, friends. Let's record. And wonderful. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stamp Chat. I'm Heidi Rhodes. May is airmail month, a time when we honor the quantum leap of innovation that transformed mail delivery. Postal services around the world have always found different ways to get mail to places that were difficult to reach. And beginning as early as 1911, that meant doing so by air, as brave men and women hopped into aircrafts to deliver the mail less than a decade after this mode of transportation was invented. By the 1920s through the 30s, Zeppelins flew mail to the Arctic, around the world, and on regular transoceanic service. They provided vital links before airplane service was available. Zeppelins were the fastest way to send mail across the ocean in their day. And so commercial mail also exists. And so some commercial mail also exists, especially on the South Atlantic route. Joining us today to talk about Zeppelin and airship mail is Dr. Cheryl Gans. Dr. Cheryl Gans is a social cultural historian and a lifelong stamp collector. These two interests have directed her research in both local postal history and Zeppelin posts. She is an active philatelic exhibitor, speaker, author, and is the curator emirata for the Smithsonian. Cheryl was appointed to the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee, the group that selects subjects for recommendations as future stamp issues. Dr. Gans is an APS member and serves on the APS Board of Vice Presidents and has been recognized with many awards, including the APS Luff Award for Exceptional Contributions to Philately. Stamp Chat is a production of the American Philatelic Society. Since 1886, the APS has served collectors with the services and support they need. With membership starting at just $25, you can join 135 years of fellowship in the hobby. So you can start taking advantage of membership benefits as soon as you join. You can check out stamps.org backslash join now. And with that, let us get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Gans, with Ways to Collect Zeppelin and Airship Mail. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Heidi. When I first started collecting Zeppelins, I had just bought anything that was attractive to me that I could afford. And it didn't take long for me to realize that I needed to narrow down my scope and take a focus so that I could advance myself to new levels of research and exhibiting. And I'm hoping that this talk will either interest you to collect, interest you to step it up a notch and try different ways, or maybe if you collect something else, find parallels to your own collecting area. So welcome to Ways to Collect Zeppelin and Airship Mail. Today is May 6. This is the anniversary of the Hindenburg disaster. So it's an appropriate day for us to honor those deceased and for us to also learn more about Zeppelins and Zeppelin mail. If you mention Zeppelins to people, most will think of the Hindenburg crash, which took place at Lakehurst, New Jersey on May 6, 1937. It's true, the salvaged mail is scarce and iconic in philately but there is much more history and philately to explore. You might wonder why do some people collect Zeppelin and airship mail? It's the lure of the 1930s golden era of aviation and its adventures. Perhaps others might enjoy um, searching through a bargain box of shoebox for a discovery or seeking a high value used on cover in their area and country of specialty. For me, the acquisition of mail takes me on a journey of discovery as I research stories of the people, the places, and the history. The bonus has been the great friends worldwide who share this interest with me and share their findings as well, including collectors, dealers, historians, archivists, and curators. 
Zeppelin and Airship Scholarship, both historical and philatelic, has boomed during my lifetime, and there's still so much more to discover and publish. If you look at this Hindenburg crash cover, it's in a glassine envelope. It didn't fly that way. The post office added that after it was salvaged for part of the delivery process. This one is very lightly burned and you might say, how could it survive that disaster? There were over 17,000 pieces of mail on board. Maybe about 400 survived, about half of those are burnt, the other half were in a fireproof container. This is an exceptionally clean, nice example. What happened was there were closed sealed bags of mail and they were packed full in a storage compartment. And if you've ever had a bonfire, you can see how the center of a magazine or a newspaper doesn't burn because oxygen can't reach it. And this is what happened to some of that mail in closed bags. It survived and was salvaged, found in the wreckage after. This example is from a, a brother in Germany to his brother in New York. And the message on the other side says, hey, I haven't heard from you in a while. You know, let's chat. And you can imagine if this piece hadn't survived, Frederick Simon would never have known his brother wrote to him. You might ask, what's the difference between a Zeppelin and an airship? Airships are lighter than air flying vehicles, usually filled with helium or hydrogen. There are three types of airships. First, rigids. A rigid would be like the British R-100 that flew to Canada round trip. Then there are semi-rigids, such as the Norgay that flew to the North Pole and non-rigids, such as the early Goodyear blimps that broadcast sporting events. Zeppelins are a type of rigid airship. That's the first type, designed by Ferdinand von Zeppelin of Germany, and the first flight was in the year 1900. Zeppelin is, is a trade name, refers to airships uh, in four ways. First, they could be built by the Luftschiffbau Zeppelin Company in Germany, or the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation in Akron, Ohio, or they're based on drawings of designs of captured military Zeppelins in World War I, or finally, there are Zeppelins flying today. They're called the NTs for new technology. All kinds of Zeppelins and airships carried mail. And here you can see on left, two of the very famous US Zeppelin stamps on a postcard. This um, is a flown by the Graf Zeppelin. So there's Zeppelin stamps on a Zeppelin postcard flown all uh, from Germany to Brazil to the United States and back the full round trip. And these two stamps combined pay the correct rate for that uh, a number of legs $1.95. Only 63 postcards were franked and sent on that route. So it's one of the scarcer varieties for this flight. And yet when you're shopping, you probably won't pay any more for the scarce varieties than you will for the others because most are priced based on the stamps. And at the right is what you would find at the other end of the purchase spectrum, very modestly priced blimp mail flown by one of the Goodyear blimps. And these are available at online auctions and in shoeboxes at stamp shows. It's important to understand the difference between official and unofficial mail. Post offices in the countries where Zeppelins and airships flew and landed would coordinate the logistics of handling mail, including announcements, collection, canceling, sorting and bagging, and distribution. Post offices from other countries arranged to have their mail dispatched to connect in landing cities or after the flight to destinations. Mail handled entirely through the postal system is official mail. Another kind of Zeppelin and airship mail is unofficial. That is mail carried by a crew member or a passenger as a favor. Unofficial mail generally has a postmark before or after the flight 
identifying this male as authentically flown can be challenging. At left, we have official mail. This was posted at the International Stamp Exhibition in New York City in 1936. We tend to call that Typex. So posted at the show, it's a first day cover. And then it was transported from New York to Lakehurst and flown on the Hindenburg back to Germany. At the right is an example of unofficial mail. Someone prepared the cachet at the left. They had the postmaster autograph it. They got a postmark on the uh, uh, day, uh, one day off from the flight. The flight was the 27th, the postmark is the next day. Probably with the help of the postmaster, this little pile of 24 pieces of mail was put in the pocket of a crew member who had come in the post office. It was flown, and then when the flight was over, he came back and dropped the mail off at the post office. So there are a lot of ways to collect Zeppelin mail. And these are exciting historical documents. And in this presentation, I'm offering a dozen popular ways that collectors have used to organize their interests. And I myself have used many of these. And we'll go through these one by one. So many people collect a specific Zeppelin or airship. Every Zeppelin collector seems to find a niche do his or her own thing. And this adds to the creative process. One popular way to collect is by a specific Zeppelin or airship. German Zeppelins, such as Graf Zeppelin and Hindenburg, made many flights with many varieties to the stamps and markings, offering much to study. The United States Navy operated four Zeppelins, including Shenandoah, Los Angeles, Akron, and Macon, plus it also flew non-rigid airships. So if you look at the cover at the left, it's actually a card. It has a Zeppelin stamp on it, a German two mark. It's got a blue cachet, which shows the Statue of Liberty as the Graf Zeppelin's arriving over New York. But if you look at the postmark, it's May 15th, and the arrival date is in August. Well, that little one line red uh, hand stamp in German explains that this was an interrupted flight and that's why there was a delay. So when the flight first took off, the airship had uh, engine trouble and had to land in France. They had to do repairs and return back to their base in Friedrichshafen, Germany. And then they rescheduled the flight and they went back later and carried the mail again. On the right, we have mail flown by the US Navy airship Zeppelin Ekron. And this was carried across the country. And this is official mail. The post office made an announcement and collected the mail. Now, what makes this piece interesting is if you look at the George Washington stamp at the far left, there's an overprint on it that says Akron Mail. That overprint is not from the post office. The dealer, Albert Rossler, put on that overprint. He also made one for the Graf Zeppelin. And he got taken to court by the post office over this. But he didn't go to jail, and his saving grace was that that one cent stamp was not part of the postage rate. It was surplus beyond what was required to fly this piece of mail. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Exciting personalities fill Zeppelin and airship history. For instance, inventors and designers, commanders and crew members, passengers, and postal officials. Some carried mail, others autographed envelopes and postcards. During the 1930s, the press featured these celebrities and parades honored their achievements. Unfortunately, some did not survive aviation disaster. And at left on this uh, official Navy envelope from the Akron, you see three autographs. Those are the three men who survived the disaster of the Akron. Everyone else on board died. And this cachet was created in their memory. And these envelopes were sold to collectors and all the funds raised went to the widows and children of the, the men who had perished. On the right, uh, this is an advertising card featuring Dr. Hugo Eckner, the most famous Zeppelin personality. And it's promoting the Leipzig trade fair, very famous, famous trade fair. 
Collecting by regions of the world allows an understanding of mail routes and expansion of postal operations. Some examples of regional collecting include the Caribbean, polar studies inside the Arctic Circle, islands in the Atlantic Ocean between continents, or Baltic states. Many who collect by regions also collect the stamps and postal history of these chosen areas, which complement their airmail cards and covers. So I've selected a couple items from the Caribbean. At left, this is flown by the US Navy Zeppelin uh, Los Angeles. This was actually an airship built in Germany and then sent to the United States as part of reparation agreements and flew for the Navy. And here's the first airmail uh, flown from the United States to Puerto Rico. And where you see that uh, ship cancel, USS Potoka, that is the ship that had a mooring mast on it. So when the Navy Zeppelins were away from their base and in fleet exercises, they could moor to a ship in the water. At right, we have a Jamaica dispatch sent up to New York and Lakehurst to fly across the ocean to, on the Hindenburg. When it got to Germany, then it was transferred over to England. Perhaps the most popular approach to Zeppelin and airship collecting is by country. Collectors choose a country for a variety of reasons, which could range from the attractiveness of the mail to a place visited on travels or work. It might be a country where a Zeppelin had, had visited or a country that had collectors or businesses that used the Zeppelin service to deliver mail. Many collectors seek flown mail from the countries of their ancestral heritage as a way to connect to the lives of their ancestors. Stamps and postmarks identify the country of dispatch. The addressee location identifies destinations. Be sure to examine the markings on the reverse of the mail to trace the flight's route and other means of transport. So at left, we have a dispatch from Uruguay. This flew by airplane Condor airplane up to Brazil, and then it was loaded on the Zeppelin to fly across the uh, Atlantic, South Atlantic, to the Gambia in Africa. And then it was transported on to Germany. And at right, look at the destination. This is to Iran. And seeking out these unusual destinations can be a very exciting way to collect mail. Graf Zeppelin made some dramatic flights as it earned the nickname of Aerial Globetrotter. Commander Hugo Eckner continually sought new destinations, flying throughout Europe, to North and South America, Asia, and Africa. From 1928 to 1937, Graf Zeppelin flew over a million miles and circumna circumnavigated the globe. A globally connected air network in Eckner's vision would benefit peace and commerce through passengers, freight, and post. Many of these high profile flights attract collectors who study all aspects of a specific flight, including the legs of the route, the stamps and markings, and the stories of what happened along the way. So here we have an example flown on the flight around the world, an example flown to the Arctic, both by Graf Zeppelin, what really excited me about the cover on the left is it's addressed to Franklin Bruns. And he later went on, he was only 17 at the time, but he later went on to be the Smithsonian curator of our National Philatella Collection, a, a role that I had later in my life. On the right, we have the Graf Zeppelin going into the Arctic where it met with a Russian icebreaker and exchanged mail. And you can see in the postage stamp, the Zeppelin and the icebreaker. And I love they added a polar bear on the ice floe. Postage rates varied widely. Each country had distinct rates for domestic, international, air mail, and Zeppelin mail, sometimes combining these rates. Rates varied for postcards, letters, or special types of mail. Additional costs might include registration or special delivery, 
or even streetcar mail along the way. In addition, rates changed frequently. There is no single source listing postage rates for Zeppelin mails. So this area of study can be challenging. On the left, we have a British dispatch sent by printed matter. And on the right, we have a German dispatch that's a sample rate. A sample rate is when you would put something inside the envelope, like a glove or a sock, and send it with the hopes of uh, building your business. Many countries, especially Germany, Brazil, and the United States, issued special Zeppelin stamps to help offset the operating costs of these flights. Specialists like to study a single stamp or a set of stamps and how these are used on the mail. They look for printing plate positions, flaws, overprints, and first day covers. The various rates of a set of stamps often tie to the rates for assorted legs of the route. Many of these stamps are engraved and the designs are lovely to study. At left is one of my favorite Zeppelin stamps. It's the 50 cent US stamp from 1933 for when Graf Zeppelin flew to the Chicago World's Fair. On the stamp, you see the Zeppelin flying over the ocean. At the left is the federal building from the fair and at right is the hangar in Germany. And all the different legs have different rates so you can find this a uh, U.S. Zeppelin stamp in a combination of a single use stamp or a block of four, depending on what part of the route it flew. At right, we have beautiful stamps from Liechtenstein. One is Graf Zeppelin and the other is Hindenburg. And just for fun, it happens to be addressed to a Zeppelin officer of the U.S. Navy. From the pioneer era, to the wartime, to the golden age of air travel, Zeppelins and airships trace the history of the early 20th century. The mail from a selected time gives additional insight into the challenges and experiences of that era. During the pioneer era before World War I, flights usually took place at air shows and public events. During World War I, Zeppelin troops, bases, and aircraft had special markings for mail. Some collectors have even chosen a single year to study. At left, we have, this is from like an air show for demonstration flights flown by one of the German Zeppelin Schwaben. And at right, we have a military piece from World War I from the Zeppelin L-48. You can see the marking Nordholz, that's where it was based in a hangar. This was signed, uh, written by the captain just days before the flight to England when it was shot down, crashed and burned. He died along with almost everyone on the crew. Both Graf Zeppelin and Hindenburg had a post office aboard for use by passengers and crew members. Stewards sold stamps, stationery and postcards and writers posted their mail into a mailbox slot. A crew member collected the mail and postmarked it with a special onboard cancel. Because of the small number of passengers writing to family and friends, these cards can be elusive. Those who collect onboard postmarks should be aware that some onboard postmarks appear on mail not created by passengers or crew. In fact, dealers and collectors could send mail in advance, undercover, and request a special postmark then often these would be flown in a closed mail bag. At left, you see the postmark reads Luftschiff Graf Zeppelin. Luftschiff is the German word for airship. And this was flown on the Pan American flight of 1930 by Graf Zeppelin from Germany to Brazil to the United States and back. And this is sent by several crew members, uh, officers Hans, uh, Hans von Schiller and Hans Fleming both signed this card. On the right is a passenger card on Hindenburg. And if you read the postmark, it says, translates to German airmail, Europe to North America, first flight, airship Hindenburg. And it's sent by a woman, Mary Day. And she was a reporter who was taking the flight.
Not all Zeppelin and airship mail flew on board. Dealers and collectors created souvenir envelopes to mark a memorable moment in the airship's history, evidenced by a postmark. Often these special event covers have a private cache design at the left side of the envelope. Some collectors seek this artwork, which might be printed, rubber stamped, or hand drawn. Others collect by cache artist. So if you think of first day covers, this is uh, the way in the 1930s Zeppelin mail was done as well. At left, this is honoring the 1930 flight of the British airship R100 to Montreal and return. And that special postmark and cache were applied at the post office to any visitor who came to the airport while the airship was there. At the right, we have a Macon cover, special event cover. It's not flown, but the cache is created to celebrate uh, different events. But what's interesting is this is postmarked aboard a ship, the USS Texas. And you'll see that there's text in the killer bars of the cancel. And a lot of ship clerks did this to honor Macon, especially when it was participating in fleet exercises. In addition to the study of stamps and postmarks, collectors examine other aspects of the mail including additional labels and markings. Etiquettes and labels can be postal for airmail or registration or private to promote events and commercial ventures. Markings can be directional, such as via Berlin, or instructional, such as return to sender. Some labels and markings are specific to the Zeppelin, while others might be regarding delivery after the flight. At left, a stamp club in Akron, Ohio, created some labels, and then they created a rubber stamp cache to tie it to the envelope. Uh, just a fun, fun souvenir. At right, we have a piece of mail that was intended to fly to Germany aboard Hindenburg, but the disaster happened. So it had to be returned to sender. You can see a rubber stamp returned to sender. In addition to a four line red cache, explaining why the mail was being returned. Many Zeppelin collectors also seek out a variety of material culture related to airships, including timetables, photographs, and picture postcards. Such ephemera add information and great visuals to the collection. Postcards offer images that cannot be found elsewhere. Printing techniques vary from real photo postcards to high volume lithography. Subject matter can include flights over cities, details of the control car, passenger quarters, hangars, mooring mass, views from the airship, holiday greeting scenes, and comic designs. Both of these cards are by the same photographer, Rel Clements. At left is a handcrafted, hand printed real photo postcard that he took of the Shenandoah in the Lakehurst hangar. And at right, he took one of his close-up shots of the control car of the Los Angeles, and he had a postcard printing company produce it in a larger volume, both airbrushing it and adding color. The history and romance of the era captivate Zeppelin and airship collectors. Collecting provides a means to learn more about the airships, people, places, and events. By studying books and catalogs, you gain knowledge that helps you to buy wisely. Always seek the best condition that you can afford and beware that forgeries exist of some mail. So here I'm showing what I would call some of the very basics if you're gonna build a library. Uh, for someone starting out buying Zeppelin mail, a catalog might seem rather expensive, but I look at it this way. If buying that catalog saves you from overpaying or from buying a forgery by mistake, you've paid for the catalog in that one moment. At the far left is the very famous Seeger catalog. This is all in German, but pretty easy to follow, and most uh, auctions use Seeger numbers. Below it is the Mickel catalog, covers much of the same uh, area. And for the specialists, they will want to own both and compare 
both catalogs when purchasing. It has both an English and a German edition. Above that, we have the U.S. Make on an Akron Special Event Cover Catalog. If that's your interest, this book is a must. The Make on alone had thousands of cached covers honoring all every, every move it made. <laughs> In the middle is a history book, uh, Zeppelin Hindenburg. The reason I would recommend this book, uh, other than the fact I'm one of the authors, is that it's probably the definitive uh, history book right now on the Hindenburg, but there's a full chapter on postal operations with a lot of photographs. And at the end of the book, the paperback edition, be sure you get that version, there's a flight list. And back stamps. At the far right, is a book coming out this fall, and I happen to be the author. This is a lifelong study of mine, and it's uh, mail flown and um, covering all the US uh, Zeppelin and airships. And finally, if you want to go on the internet and join a group or at least look over something, try the Facebook group uh, Zeppelin Airship Collectors and for general airmail, the American Airmail Society. I know in today's world, a lot of people just want to go on the internet and find all their answers, but you will not find a Zeppelin catalog listing all the flights and giving you guidelines on what values are on the internet. You are going to have to get a catalog. You decide what and how to collect, the scope of your collection, and how much time, energy, and funds you want to spend. In fact, you can collect the world with Zeppelin mail, or you can focus on a very small subject, or you could just collect whatever pulls your heartstrings. And that's what I put here. This is one of the things that pulls my heartstrings. When I was a child, I wanted to be an Egyptologist. Now, instead of archaeology, I sort through paperwork in archives and sort uh, mail. But the Egypt flight has always been special to me as a result. And this is postmarked with an onboard cancel by uh, Graf Zeppelin. And it's sent by a couple who were on the flight. And you can read their message. So it's heartfelt greetings from the trip home. And they're just about to fly over the pyramids. At the right, you see a photograph of the pyramids taken from the Zeppelin. And below is a stereo card photograph of the Graf Zeppelin flying over the pyramid. So even if you just want it for personal enjoyment, uh, these um, cards and covers will lead you down an adventure to study all about what happened on the flight. So why collect? Well, whatever motivates you to acquire, organize, and enjoy might also motivate you to consider the next steps, such as sharing through presentations, exhibits, and published stories. Most importantly, have fun. Here's a long list of reasons you can collect. I have to admit that every one of those is true for me. And I'm sure many of those apply to those of you watching, even if Zeppelin mail isn't what you're specifically collecting. So I hope you enjoyed this program, and we will open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gans. At wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, like we, like Dr. Gans said, if you have questions for our friends that are on the Zoom webinar, if you would please use the Q and A box, that would be fantastic. And for our friends on YouTube and Facebook, go ahead and use the chat box, and I will toggle between. So let's get started. Let's see if this chat is. So when did the U.S. and when did Germany get out of the ship business? Out of the airship business? Yes. Um, in Germany, they still are in the business, but there was a big gap in between. So when the Hindenburg crashed, Graf Zeppelin was on its flight back from South America. They did not tell the passengers that there had been a crash. They returned to Germany and landed. And then the Graf Zeppelin did not make uh, passenger flights again. There was a ship being built to follow Hindenburg. It's 
called the LZ-130, and then they also named that Graf Zeppelin. But it never carried paying passengers because the United States under Harold Ickes would not export helium to National Socialist Germany, and rightly so. So that pretty well ended the uh, large rigid airships of Germany, although uh, non-rigid airships have been flown as advertising for a long time. And then in more recent years, the Zeppelin company started building what they call the NTs, the new technology. Those fly in Germany and actually Goodyear is now flying three of those here in the United States. For the United States, we had uh, five rigid airships. One never made it to the United States from England, but the Navy flew four rigid airships. Three of the four crashed. And after the final crash, the Macon, that was pretty well the end of the program. Congress wasn't going to allocate more money and neither was the Department of the Navy. But the Navy went on to fly non-rigid airships, what we would call blimps, uh, over 200 of them in World War II, and they served as coastal patrol, and they also prevented submarines from attacking our ships at sea. And no ship was lost while under escort by a US Navy blimp. Uh, the Navy program ended in the 60s. But I'm on mute. And that's incredible that the Navy program had an airship. That's incredible. Uh, and friends, I do see uh, some of your questions and about um, Facebook groups and, and groups, and we will get to that. I'm going to I'm going to ask Dr. Gan some of the more uh, scholarly questions for for the moment. Can you speak to the Russian efforts to create their own Zeppelin? Yes, um, Russia built airships, uh, they put them on postage stamps. They weren't extremely successful. Many of them were more experimental. Um, Umberto Nobile, who flew to the North Pole on the Norway and the Italia, was uh, uh, hired by Russia to come as a consultant. And there have been books written on the Russian airship program. But um, nothing was um, capable of flying beyond a small distance, so they never left the country. From uh, Foster Miller, who is from the American First Aid Cover Society, he says that he, he so enjoyed the summer seminar presentation and he bought the book and that it's great. And he's been buying Hindenburg covers, but he wants to know, he says, there seems to be a wide variety of prices for Hindenburg from a few dollars to hundreds of dollars. Is there a pricing guide? Yes, yeah, so this is where I recommend the Seeger and Mickle catalogs even if you don't speak German. When you're buying US dispatches on the 10 trips made in 1936, those are very fair priced. I mean, you can find those for 10 to $50 and with a variety of commemoratives on them. People who collect 1930 commemoratives, you wanna be sure and try and find those Hindenburg covers, especially because the rate was uh, 40 cents for the flight, three cents for airmail in the US, three cents for airmail in Europe. So if you collect one of those three cent stamps, you want to try and find it used for one of those three cent additional parts of the rate. Uh, the German covers that are the, um, flown on those 10 round trips, just a standard basic cover should also sell in the 10 to $50 range. Uh, depending on condition, who's selling it, where you're looking, et cetera. Commercial mail, which um, is important part of this story can often be found very reasonable. I have bought commercial covers on eBay for uh, 5 to $20 flown by Hindenburg. Now, there are varieties and things that start to get higher and higher. And as soon as you buy covers to a foreign destination, you're bumping up to a couple hundred. If you buy dispatched from other countries, you're also bumping up from a couple hundred to a couple thousand, depending on the rarity of the country. But um, Onboard postmarks, like I showed, written by passengers and crew, are going to cost more because those are more elusive. And um, there are other little varieties that will tend to uh, make it more difficult to find something, and that can bring prices up a little as well. But when you see a traditional kind of cover selling very high priced, 
I think you're just uh, looking at a dealer who really might not himself be aware of how common it is for a Zeppelin mail. Not common compared to other mail, but compared to other kinds of Zeppelin mail. Thanks, Foster. On the ship with the mast on the cover of your new book, are those spindly things, ladders to offload crew? Um, well, I'm not sure exactly which things you mean, but there are booms coming off to the side uh, from the mooring mast, and those booms uh, had cables that connected to the ship so that the ship, uh, if it was just attached at the nose, it could dance all over the place, and those booms would uh, help control um, the ship from moving up and down. Uh, the ship certainly could rotate uh, the airship on that mast because, it, you know, like so many things, it would want to be flying toward the wind or pointed toward the wind. I hope that that's what you were talking about. So it, it's kind of serendipity, Dr. Guns, that I was uh, I'm, I was looking at Facebook and watching our stream, and uh, there there's a person who is interested in airmail and is writing a children's book. So uh, you know, I, she poses this question, or they pose this question. Um, they, they're they're very interested in the um, the stamp and the design and manufacturing. So. Um, do you, can you speak about any of the designers of the stamps or um, more to that nature? Um, well, I could talk certainly about the United States stamps to start right. with. There were four U.S. Zeppelin stamps, not including the one that came out um, when the Postal Museum opened. There's a Zeppelin stamp stuck on that one, too, if you look for it. But of the four U.S. stamps, they were printed by the Bureau of uh, Engra uh, Engraving and Printing. They were designed by uh, uh, an engraver named um, McCluskey. And he received a photograph of the Graf Zeppelin when it was in Los Angeles at Mines Field on the Round the World flight. And he used that photograph as his source to do the drawing of the Zeppelin on all four stamps. And that original photograph is in the um, BEP archive. Um, those stamps were then engraved. And what you might find interesting is that you would have a different engraver for the vignette in the center. Then someone else would do the frame and the lettering and someone else might do the numerals for the value. If you're interested in, in this aspect of the design, you wanna look at books by Max Joel. He, he wrote a lot of books about that time period about postage stamps and how they were made and uh, the artists that worked on them. Around the world, uh, different postal systems either have their artists in-house or they hire someone to do the artwork. I can't believe the kismet of that. That's incredible. She was, she was just, uh, sorry, I'm looking at, there's a time lapse. There was just, she was just asking me those questions. That's, that's, <laughs> that's so cool. Okay, um, let's see. Did any airships make a round the world trip? And if so, what was the route across the Pacific? Um, so the Graf Zeppelin flew around the world, but not nonstop. Um, it started out, and this is an interesting story. They actually had to fly around the world one and a half times to go around the world. It was in Germany but the Hearst newspapers of the United States offered to sponsor the flight That's good. if the flight would start in the United States. Thank you. So the Graf Zeppelin flew from Germany to the United States and then began its flight back to Germany. From Germany, it flew over uh, Russia and landed in Japan. From Japan, it flew over the Pacific to San uh, through San Francisco, but landing in Los Angeles. Los Angeles back to Lakehurst, where it finished the American round the world part of the flight. Then it flew back to Germany, where Germans celebrated it flying around the world from Germany. Uh, over the Pacific itself, it mainly flew over water. It didn't like seek out Hawaii or any of the islands.
So other countries have featured airship Zeppelins on their stamps, but how many other countries besides USA and Germany actually had their own airships? Um, a few, not everybody, a few. It, this was an expensive program and they were usually military, although in Germany now it was a private company. Um, in Great Britain, uh, the, the military had airships and quite a few. They started out in with also non-ridges, but they had quite a few rigids in, uh, from the World War I era and through 1930. And there's every, every one of their ships tended to be experimental, so they never really got in a groove the way the German airships did. And they also had several disasters. And the final disaster was known as the R101 that left uh, England, on Cardington, England in Bedford on its way to India, but it was so overburdened with weight that it crashed in a rainstorm in France along the way. Italy had um, a lot of non-rigids. It obtained uh, one of the rigids as reparations after the war, not known for flying that. Spain obtained one of those also. Many of those were in such tough shape, they ended up not flying. But a lot of these countries, France, had non-rigid airships. But the rigids, Zeppelin rigids, the big ones, were really only a few countries. Uh, Japan had non-rigid airships also. So quite a few countries have had the smaller uh, blimp style airships. Would you recommend any books non-stamp related about airship Zeppelins? Um, and there's a lot of them out there. Mm -hmm. um, other than the Hindenburg one that I've already talked about, uh, there's an older classic um, on the Graf Zeppelin by Gordon Vaith. Um, there's a couple newer ones. Um, I think the difficulty with a lot of the literature out there is that some of it is more journalistic and playing on um, concepts that might not be really true rather than being detailed studies that are accurate. Uh, unfortunately, the ones that are more accurate tend to be pretty dry reading. Mm -hmm. uh, any book by Douglas Robinson or William Althoff are absolute solid books. I hope that helps. Besides Germany, is there any other country now still experimenting with airships? Um, I would say no. Uh, United States, of course. Um, we've had several companies. Unfortunately, the pandemic really put an end to a lot of these lighter than air companies. They were so dependent on advertisers. And with the pandemic, everything just came to ground to, to a halt. And so some of these companies just can't survive it. Wow. Wow. These final questions, unless friends, of course, you have some more time if you'd like to ask Dr. Gans a um, uh, question or share your thoughts. Uh, these two, Dr. Gans, uh, they're about the, the Zeppelin uh, and the airship study group. So we have one here from our webinar and then one to follow up here on uh, YouTube. So thanks again for an excellent lecture, of course. Also, will the Zepp airship group meet this August at the, St the Chicago Stamp Show? And then the other question is, what happened to Zeppelin Study Group? Okay, so first about meeting. We haven't met in a while because of the pandemic, but we have applied for a Friday meeting at the GAS Stamp Show, Great American Stamp Show in Chicago in August. I expect that to go forward. We've also applied to have a meeting at CAPEX in Toronto, Canada next year. There might be more meetings than that, but at the moment we've just applied for those two. For Zeppelin study groups. At one time, I, I was an editor or co-editor with Jim Hill for 37 years of a Zeppelin study group. And there were two study groups in uh, Germany. And uh, for a variety of reasons, um, all of them kind of stopped operating. And that's when we went to the Facebook group because the difficulty with any study group that publishes a journal is collecting dues, having the volunteers, 
and getting out a regular journal. And most of these small groups just found everything fell upon one or two people and uh, people get overloaded. And it's just uh, more and more difficult in today's world. With a Facebook group, there are no dues. There are no um, jobs. Nobody has uh, expectations of anyone else. It also means you aren't getting research published on those sites. Uh, so there's a disadvantage. What it means is those of us who are writers or do research have to find other venues for our articles. Uh, I have, for example, recently sent an article to the Collectors Club of New York, Collectors Club Philatelist. Um, and uh, many of us have published in various journals from the German Postal Specialist to the Air Post Journal. So uh, between articles and books, that's, that's where the more serious work is being done now. And the internet is more to help people answer questions and see new things and find out what's going on. Yeah. Dr. Gans, can you, uh, can you mention that Facebook group again? I'm going to put it into the chat on YouTube. Yes, um, it's Zeppelin and Airship Collectors. Okay, great. Zeppelin and Airship Collectors on Facebook. And when we meet at uh, Chicago uh, Great American Stamp Show, everyone is welcome. These meetings aren't closed to anyone. Because there are people who may not use Facebook or the internet who still care. That's true. That's true. Uh, so uh, Foster Miller from American First Day Cover Society, again, he comes in and says, just bought a copy of the 2003 Michelle catalog in English on eBay. Can you repeat the title spelling of the other catalog? Um, the one is the Seeger catalog, S-I-E-G-E-R, a Zeppelin post catalog in German. But uh, if you say, put in the word Seeger with Zeppelin, um, that'll, that possibly will come up. There are several editions. If you end up paying less to get an older edition, you're still going to get the value range. I mean, you're, you may not get the exact price, but you're going to be able to tell, is this a $10 item or a $1,000 item? So that's, that's what's important. It's, these are guidelines. Wonderful. And I'm just monitoring. Well, you, you have received accolades across the streaming channels. Dr. Gans, thank, thank you, you so much for this beautiful talk. Such a fascinating topic. Uh, what a technology from, I don't know, I, I always think yesteryear, but you know, it, look at the Goodyear blimp or at, at Penn State yeah. over Beaver Stadium. So just a fascinating topic. And I'm really happy that we were able to answer questions, particularly this, this person who uh, is new to the hobby and new to, to collecting this in particular. So thank you so much. And I, and I hope that you'll take a moment to uh, uh, you know, join me, everyone, in thanking Dr. Gans for this presentation, for her time um, and all of this knowledge. And I hope that you'll go and add this to your collecting interests if, if you aren't an airmail collector yet. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Gans. And you can find more of Dr. Gans's presentations, of course, at stamps.org. She has been a regular guest, either through Stamp Chat and uh, virtual stamp show. She's also got writing on stamps.org. So if you'd like to find out more and follow her work, you can certainly find that on the APS website. Stamp Chat is a production of the American Philatelic Society through the generous support of our Mighty Buck Club. We've been able to produce hundreds of hours of philatelic presentations free and accessible to all. Just $1 every month makes a mighty impact. That's a $12 a year. Uh, that's only $12 a year. And when you become a part of the Mighty Buck Club, you're supporting the present and the future of our hobby, join the club. That's the Mighty Buck Club at stamps.org. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you on the next Stamp Chat. On, and you can find this on the HPS uh, YouTube channel or we will have it uploaded on the stamps.org momentarily. If you choose to go over to the YouTube channel, you'll find hundreds of our Stamp Chats and be sure to like, subscribe and use the comment box to keep the conversation going between you and the presenter or you and other collectors. Until our next Stamp Chat, connect, collect, learn, and be inspired. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, on stamps.org. The American Philatelic Society.
social since 1886. Thanks so much, Dr. Guns. Thank you and everyone for joining us tonight.